Hi, it's afternoon in Kansas, and so I would like to welcome you to the Healing Path, whatever time it is where you live, and tell you that once again, I have a wonderful guest who is going to speak today, uh, John Meese, about surviving and thriving in any economy. And I want to remind you that the purpose of the Healing Path is to create a space where people can share ideas and information about healing, about their personal healing path, and inspire others to realize that the, the real beginning of healing is a personal decision to heal inside. And then whatever method you use, modality, that once you have made that commitment to do the healing, the teacher shows up, the method shows up, and the journey begins. So I'll bring John on, and he can tell you a little bit more about himself. Hi, hey. John. Thank you so much for having me join you today. I'm glad to be here. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm actually really excited. I'm really excited. Good. To Good. Have, you know, I've kind of followed your work for some time. In, oh, in, and so to talk to you in person is, is like always a special Oh, wonderful. Thank person, you. The person behind the emails, the person behind the videos, um, it's just very lovely. So thank well, thank you. you. I mean, that's that's really important. And I've shared this several times. I had a, well, I had a pod, I have, so I have a podcast called Thrive School. And on one of the episodes where I announced my new book, you know, what I said was, hey, I came out with, you know, a couple hundred pieces of paper with some ink on it. Because <laughs> that's really all it is until you read it. Right. And the same thing goes for, Actually, even less could be said for my emails. I'm not even sure what they are until you read them, if they even exist. You know, um, if you send an email and no one reads it, you know, does it make a sound? I don't know. But um, so, anyways, I just want to say thank you for you know for reading and for following along because um, you know uh, a a teacher can't teach without students, so I, I do need people to actually you know want to learn, and which uh, thankfully has been true in my in my story. So uh, I'm glad to be here and happy to help. That's wonderful. I'll pop this up and down a couple of times for people. It's the name of the book, and then uh, we'll put it in the comments at the end. There it is. Look at that. Yeah, so it's a brand new book. So yeah, so I guess you should probably know, if you don't know who I am, which probably is most people on the planet, uh, I'm John Meese. Uh, I am the author of the book Survive and Thrive, How to Build a Profitable Business in Any Economy, Including This One. It's a new book. It came out July 27. Uh, it is a number one bestseller in direct marketing, top 10 books in small business, top 100 in entrepreneurship. All wonderful things that I'm excited about. Um, it's it, you know continue to get in the hands of more and more entrepreneurs who are putting into practice in their business to either start a new business or scale an existing business. And um, I love that one of the early reviewers referred to the book as a weekend MBA. I think that's a great oh, description cool. of it. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper than an MBA, though. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's built on your personal experience, right? Yes. Yeah, so I've started three businesses of my own from scratch, you know, um, and you know, two of those I run now, or I say run, I mean, I, I own, I run one of them. I'm the, so I'm the CEO or the chief education officer of Cowork Inc., which is sort of my core company. Um, so Cowork.inc is our website. But then I'm also the co-founder of another company uh, called Notable. Notable.press is where you are learning some of about that website, that company I know. Um, and um, I also have another kind of, a company that's more in the past is house all my consulting and writing and that kind of stuff and online courses. But that's really become co-working has become my focus. But I built those companies from scratch. I bootstrapped them without any, you know, outside investment. But I also, when I ran platform university for over three years, working on Michael Hyatt's leadership team, I saw behind the scenes how he was able to build his company and scale it from, you know, nothing. Essentially he started it, you know, and was able to scale that company to, you know, make, 10 and then 15 million dollars a year in revenue from a small team you know and to fuel his lifestyle where now if you look at his instagram uh feed he's uh really treating his uh his beard and boat life as if that's his full-time job so he still has a business that's doing well but he has other people operating it um uh, but then my dad also you know had his own business for 30 well more longer than i've been alive so uh, for a long time and i worked in that business as a teenager worked for chick-fil-a for close to a decade as a training director i got to learn about their business but then I also have a degree in economics. So I got this like weird combination of like experience in my own and other people's that about how to build businesses that I became really passionate about my personal mission now, 
which is to eradicate generational poverty by helping people, helping entrepreneurs create thriving businesses and helping people become entrepreneurs, right? Who aren't thinking about it. Um, that I believe that's the best way to really build a life, uh, a lifestyle that you control. I mean, really where you can have a business fuel your lifestyle, um, and rather than the other way around. And so that's what this book is about. And that's what I'm about. So that's a little bit about me. I've also got a wife and three beautiful kids. And that's really where, honestly, that's behind this video. Like that's what I'm looking back at the background. And that's where my heart is. Awesome. Well, I have a question for you because yeah. since you've been in this field for a really long time, this, the idea of self-employment, right? Like in my family, most everybody in my generation was self-employed. Only a few people got jobs, quote unquote jobs. Most everybody else built their own business and they didn't, while they were entrepreneurial in spirit, they didn't define themselves as an entrepreneur. Then I thought back and my grandpa ran his own business and my grandma's father ran a, ran a barbershop. I mean, and so I'm like, this is like in my blood. Yeah, sounds like it. And my mom ran her own business. My brother runs his his own business. You know, it's it's a it's a okay. I'm not going to tell everybody that it's for everybody. It's challenging, mm -hmm. and it's um, the income is probably not consistent in my in my situation. That's been my experience. I've had great times, and I've had some kind of like <gasps> times. Yeah. and and we're kind of in one of those times. And I think also potentially. what. I said potentially, but we could talk more about that in a minute. Well, potentially one of those times. Well, yes, I think I think that that um, one of the things people say is that in a in a disrupted economy, there there are opportunities to provide services that weren't needed before, and and for for somebody who's thinking in a creative way, you can you can maybe create a business that there was no room for in a in another way of of living. Yeah. But I have already, mm -hmm. sorry, I was going to say I live in Kansas, right? So I'm way out in the middle of anywhere. So I had started working online before even COVID came because, because I'm far from the world. Because <laughs> you have to. Yeah. But I liked it. And then it became the norm for everybody. So that was interesting for me. Yeah. Well, okay. So two things. One is you mentioned that you, you have all these entrepreneurs in your family, but they know it never you know, would have called themselves an entrepreneur. And that's definitely true for me as well. You know, my dad, I don't have a long line of entrepreneurs in my family, but my dad was self-employed for, uh, you know, 35, 40 years as a painting contractor. Um, and he was an entrepreneur, but he never used that word. And so it took me a while to kind of figure that out and really also to redefine entrepreneurship, which by the way, there aren't really any good agreed upon definitions of entrepreneur. Like the definition in the dictionary says it's one who takes upon, well, it comes from a French word, which means risk taker. And so it's usually defined as like someone who takes on the risk of starting a business. But it's like, yeah, okay. I mean, that's true, but that's not really enough. And so the definition that I love, which I've heard from several people, one of them being Michael Hyatt is where probably I first heard it, is that entrepreneurs solve problems for a profit. And so what I teach, you know, is this framework of building a business where you're creating real solutions to real problems for real people. That's good business. That's entrepreneurship. And every one of those examples in your family that you're talking about, that's what they've done, right? They've created, they, they may not have thought about it that way, but they've been creating real solutions to real problems for real people. So secondarily, one of the things I wanted to comment on is that it's, you know, there, there are a lot of people who are, their business are, is struggling you know, right now, or even their personal life is, you know, chaotic right now. I've had my own share of that. Definitely. Uh, probably, uh, more higher than average share of that, I think. Um, but there are also plenty of other entrepreneurs who are having their best years ever in business. And one of the things we talk about in, in my book, survive and thrive is there's two things that I think are really important to consider here in every economic crisis. There's sort of like the right side and the wrong side of the crisis. Now, um, you might say that, well, yeah, the right side of the crisis would have been to get into the hand sanitizer production business, you know, <laughs> yeah. and sure, sure. That would be like the extreme right side where like you did really well if you sell hand sanitizer. Um, but there's also 
there's it's a spectrum, right? You know, so there's also the reality that is that once you realize that your job as an entrepreneur is to create real solutions to real problems for real people, then again, I love this. Uh, Michael Hyatt, you know, I was working with him at the beginning of the COVID crisis when he called together his coaching clients and he's and they were saying, What do we do? You know, do we, you know, how do we grow our business now? And he said, Well, do your customers have more problems or less problems than they did before 2020? And everyone said, well, yeah, they have more problems. He's like, okay, well, then you've got work to do, right? Because as an entrepreneur, that's your job is to solve problems. Maybe the same solutions you offered before don't fit now. Maybe they're out of date or maybe they're not relevant right now. But the reality is people have problems and they need solutions. And that's what entrepreneurs, that's what we exist. That's why we exist. That's what we do is we solve problems. Um, so uh, there's plenty of work to be done right now. There's plenty of success to be had for entrepreneurs if you're willing to be a servant entrepreneur by looking around for problems that you can solve with a business. I like that part about your work to, to be of service in addition to, you know, I mean, I think if you start with this idea of being in service, solving a problem, helping people, that's very different than if you're like, well, I got to make this thing and sell it so I make money. That's a really different energy. Yeah. And um, well, how do you how do you figure out how to serve people? Well, you kind of just hit on it a little bit that it's kind of complicated, right? Because you're like, well, the truth is, you do need to make money, right? right. And so, and, and this is actually chapter one of my book is literally all about this. It's called the Entrepreneur's Paradox, and talks about how um, entrepreneurs get paid but they don't work for money. In fact, the entrepreneurs who typically don't succeed, what I've seen over and over again, are the ones that are so focused on making a sale that they miss the human being on the other side of the business. And so this is why, by the way, whenever we talk about creating your, you know, your business plan, we talk about creating a real solution to real problems for real people. The world real in there is in there three times because so many entrepreneurs, get they miss that. And they're talking about, well, we have, we want to get 10,000 fans on, on some social media platform. And we want to get a hundred thousand customers and make a million dollars. And those are all fine numbers, but they really, it's so easy to disconnect them from the real human beings on the other side that every time you get a follower with the exception of maybe some, you know, scam bots, every time you get a follower on social media, that's a real human being who's saying, I mean, they're, they're, they're quietly saying, I wonder if you can help me make my life better right? When they're following you on social media or commenting on something, when they're subscribing to your email list, they're saying, I really hope that you can solve my problem, but I'm not sure because I've been burnt before, right? I'm a little bit cynical. I need you to prove, I need you to earn my trust. The first time they buy a product from you, they're saying they're looking, well, I mean, sometimes people will go straight for the big, you know, your flagship product, your most expensive product, but most customers want to start with a lower risk and say, okay, you know what? I, I think I trust you. I want to see if you can help me make my life better. I want to see if you can help me become either healthier, wealthier, or happier, which are like essentially the three broad categories of what people want. So I'm willing to pay you, you know, for one of your, cheap, you know, maybe $10 or $50 or $100 for a product to try it out, to take a chance. But right. then as a customer, now I'm a real person who's just made a risk, taken a risk and invested some money been buying one of your products or services, and now I'm holding my breath, waiting to see if it was worth it, if I made the right decision. And the only way that you can prove that to me is if you help me achieve results above and beyond what I paid to you. If I pay you $100, and then you help me do something where I earn $100, well, then we just broke even. It was essentially a waste of time, and neither of us are satisfied. <laughs> um, but if I pay $100 for a product where you help me make $1,000 or $10,000 in return, now all of a sudden, I love you <laughs> and I will do that as many times over and over again as I can. And so of course your all of your products don't have to be about making people make money, but that's just an easy math there to just think about that that people are taking a risk and a chance, you know, by engaging with your business and they're not looking to be one more customer in the list of followers or customers in your database or your CRM. They're real human beings with problems and they're searching for solutions. And so it's really, it's, it's a beautiful, uh, business is a beautiful ministry. And personally, I view profit as in the money, you know, money is not, profit is not just the money left over at the end of the month. I view profit as a scorecard for how well you've served humanity. And so whenever I see that number, I go, okay, I got to go back and do more, right? Because there's more to serve. 
Right, and you and I read. I'm not going to remember it, but I read it in your in your book that the that profit is is a combination of things. Yes, not just money. Yeah, and um, so maybe you share a little bit about that. Sure. Well, first of all, let's back up and just think about what it means to profit from something. I mean, it's sort of like the idea of wealth. We immediately jump to dollar signs because it's easier to count those. But the reality is, you know. Profit is really all, all of this is saying is it's about your, your increase or your gain. But you profit from going to the gym. You profit from eating healthy. Because when you do that, you make decisions where you're taking your some sort of cost and you're getting a reward that's greater. You know, that you go to the gym and the cost is it's sweaty, it hurts, you don't enjoy it. But then the reward is you feel great, you look great, and you live longer. And so that's a profit. Right. And so when we think about profit, I would say, first of all, think about how your business can actually profit you multidimensionally. I am right now talking to you inside of a co working space that I own, which the co working space makes money, but it also profits me in the sense that I have the corner office in downtown Columbia, Tennessee, on the square, on the ground level with three huge windows, big courthouse out my out, out beautiful courthouse out my window over here, door right there where I can walk. You know, you can't see it. There, that, that door goes in the co working space. There's another one off camera where I, can walk outside onto the street and you know into a beautiful area where I live a mile and a half away where I can you know walk home or bike home or drive home and see my wife and kids and spend time with them in a house where we don't have internet by design because we want to be fully present at home and so that that's one of the ways that this co-working space profits me is because it it allows me to live this life where I can work here and live you know with and enjoy life there but even beyond that like even if we're just talking about profit as money, you know, once you've counted your profit, it's sort of like the end of a math equation. So you got to think about, well, how do you get there? And sure, we could talk about accounting principles. That's its own thing. But I'd like to think of more of the philosophy of it, that your profit, you know, is a measure, it's a scorecard of your business that's a combination of a few things. One of them is your effectiveness. How effective are you at actually solving problems? Are you effective enough that you can solve problems in such a way that your reputation is strong, that your customer base grows, and that your revenue grows considerably? But it's also a measure of how efficient you are doing it. Are you effective and are you efficient? Because your efficiency, it's like, well, you can pull off a really incredible experience and lose money on it because you spent so much time and money putting it together that you actually you know, didn't make any profit. Okay, well, so efficiency is an important metric too. But the third one, because a lot of people would say, okay, sure, effectiveness, efficiency. The third one is enjoyability. And most people just assume that work is work and you can't measure your business success based on enjoyability. But I need to, <coughs> pardon me, <sighs> but I needed to enjoy that water because it was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was struggling to get those words out. But enjoyability is crucial because you as a human being, your ability to sustain your focus and energy over the long run with any project is related to whether or not you enjoy it. Going back to the gym example, if you just go to a gym that you hate and do exercises that you don't enjoy because you want to get fit, it's not going to last. You could do it for a while. You can be stubborn enough to do it for a while, and that's fine, but eventually you're going to quit because you don't like it. The way to sustain your physical health is to find something you enjoy. For me, that's jujitsu. I go to jujitsu classes. I really enjoy it. And it's a great workout. But in your business, you similarly have to find the work that you enjoy that drives results because then you can sustain that over the long run uh, because it fuels your life rather than your life fueling your business. That's really, that's really important. And, you know, and it actually translates all across everything that you might do. Like, like in your house, making meals for your family. If you're effective, then you you make a meal that solves all the nutrition problems. If you're efficient, you happen to have stuff in your freezer and on your shelves that you don't have to go to the store right before you cook. And and then when you present it, it's enjoyable for everybody to sit down and eat and share this bounty together. Mm. And so even though we kind of are talking about business, everything you're saying actually applies to personal life yeah and and this idea you also touched on it just a minute ago that um that people often work 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 so that they can take time off mm -hmm. and if 
if you embed these, you know, effective and efficient practices into your business life, it doesn't take you quite as much time. So you have a little more time for enjoyment. And then the truth is how you do anything is really how you do everything. Yeah. And if it helps, there's, those are three E's. Maybe you picked up on that, but you know, efficient, effective, enjoyable, you know, so if that helps just thinking about that, did, I, did this, did this task pass the triple E test? You know, how's my business doing on the triple E test? Um, but you know, you were also just getting at a great example with, uh, with cooking that it's not a, ma- it's not a matter of just like, do you grow your business or not grow your business? Do you cook or do you not cook how you do it? What you do within that category is where you get to decide because it may be that maybe you're not enjoying it. Maybe every night you're you're, you're sort of guilt ridden and feeling like I need my family to get healthier and we need to save some money and stop eating out. So I'm going to cook dinner every night. But then maybe you get this really complicated cookbook and you're spending an hour slaving over a hot stove. You put the food out. Your kids come to the table. It takes them about three minutes to eat it, two minutes to complain about something on the plate they don't like, and then five minutes to go wash their hands and go in the next room. And then you're stuck with a sink full of dishes. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter how efficient or effective you are at that meal. It's not going to last because you don't enjoy it. And so if you can then back up and say, okay, what can we do here? Well, I know in our family, we had this problem. This is a real problem. I've got three young boys who eat as if they were grown boys. Um, and then, of course, I'm also a grown boy. So so my wife and I were in this situation where there's a constant need to eat food in our house. Uh, it doesn't seem to stop. And so we found, through a friend's recommendation, a book, a cookbook called Cook Once, Eat All Week. Ah, oh, nice. And it's a really great cookbook. There's other tools like it. I'm not saying that you have to use that one. But the point was, it's all about how the book has a system where it's like, okay, if you could take 90 minutes on a Saturday or Sunday, whatever, and do all this prep where you're not actually doing food prep for the whole week. You're prepping food so it's like 80% done. So then on a Tuesday night, you just have to do the last 20%. You pull the dishes out that are already like, you know, sliced and cut and sorted. You throw them in the pan, you heat it up, you're done. And you guys sit down to a great, delicious, healthy meal. That was like, that was a total game changer in our family life. That one book, just because it, we're still cooking, we're still buying groceries, but how we did it changed whether or not it passed the triple E test. That's, see, that's so great. That's a way to take something that you're doing that's keeping everything going, but it's, it's got that survival energy mm-hmm. instead of that thriving energy. And, and really and truly, when you were talking about it, you started smiling and you started, yeah. you know, remembering. I started salivating too, but yes. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> so now change and dealing with change and mm-hmm. being, uh, being your own boss. And, and see, and I know, I know a lot of people that I talk to sometimes they say, they say, well, how, how have you been able to do this your whole life? How were you, how were you, Weren't you afraid? And I'm like, honestly, every time I had a real job, something changed about the job. And it and it either wasn't the job I started or the the business changed and my skill sets no longer fit the business. I you know, I said, it's just easier for me to run my own business and change the business with my skills as I want yes. than to go through all the uh, well, for me, it's like fitting myself into the hiring box. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, it, I mean, the truth is we're all in business. It's just a question of how many clients do you have? And if you have one employer, you have one client, right? If all of your income comes from one employer, you have one client. You're building your business with one client. If that one client decides they no longer need your services, you're out of business. So, yeah, I know I get the same question from people who have jobs and are like, well, isn't it risky to be an entrepreneur? I'm like, well, it's sure as heck, you know, risky to be an employee. All it takes is one boarding or a round of impersonal layoffs or saying the wrong thing in a meeting to get let go. Um, and you don't really, you're not in control there. I mean, you just got to yeah. accept it. And so some people choose and say, you know what? You're right. There's... Uh, I, there's not as much freedom and there's not a ton of security, um, in that employment, but there's enough security and stability that it's worth it. And so for some people, they say that, you know, that's worth the risk and that's okay, but it, it didn't stick for me. I could, I, employment didn't, didn't stick for me. Um, so here we are. Yeah. Well, and, and also a lot of times when somebody's employed, they have something that they really love and they can start that. So, 
So your book, is this, is this good for people just starting out? Is it good for people in the middle of their business? Good for people who are really established and want to grow? Because, because I know a couple of people who are yes. you know, like coming on to retirement and, and not ready to stop working, but maybe ready to stop that consistent job. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, I would say if you're not sure, well, I mean, I mean, the first thing I would say is that it's phenomenal. It's absolute best if you're just now starting a business or if you're thinking about starting a business. This book is designed to be the playbook that I wish I had for how to do it. I mean, how to do the key things, not everything, right? What are the key few ingredients in your business you need to have in place to really ensure your success and your survival? Because by the way, the vast majority of businesses uh, fail. I mean, over 50% fail within the first five years. Not good odds. Um, we want, we want you to be, we want you to beat the average, but if you're not sure, cause I would say it's phenomenal for brand new entrepreneurs. It's great for early stage entrepreneurs. It can also be really good for mid stage entrepreneurs. If there's a piece of your business that's missing. So maybe you're really strong in one area like marketing or sales, but maybe you're really weak in the finance, financial management perspective. Like, are you cash flow positive or, you know, you do use a system like profit first. Uh, there's some other frameworks that you don't have to know what they mean. But my point is this, that if you're at all unsure, I actually have an assessment you can take. So it's free. You can I go to, you, you did that? I yeah. did it. It's great. Actually, it's really great. So um, uh, if yeah. you tell me. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah. So you go okay. to yourthrivescore.com. So okay. yourthrivescore.com. And it's a free assessment. And you take it, and it's going to give you a numerical score when you're done. That's your Thrive Score, right? Well, it's a scale of a 1 to 100. So if you get, I'd say, anything less than a 70, Get the book. It's going to help you increase your score. And, you know, I don't Does have it. to. Does yeah, it right? got it. That's right. That's exactly what it is. Go to yourthrivescore.com. So when you get your score, it's not just about getting the score. It's also about finding out where you're at and then improving, right? There's no leaderboard for who has the highest score, right? It's just like if you've got a 65 or a 52, okay, well, then now you know which areas of your business you scored poorly in. And you can go back and go through the structures that's in this book, um, Survive and Thrive to build out and ensure up and, and, you know, convert to thriving those areas of business that aren't currently thriving so that you get as close to a hundred as possible. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever scored a hundred on the assessment. That's fine. That's not the purpose of it. I scored a hundred once just because I know the correct answer to every question because <laughs> I created the assessment. So, um, well, what's, but I was testing it. What's good about it for me that what I enjoy too, is it, is it, it got me to think about, parts of my business that I skip over because mm. I think everybody is like this. And I, and I sort of yep. think that this is one reason that, um, well, like it's nice to, to be live near your family so that you have aunts and uncles and grandparents because parents see their kids from one perspective mm -hmm. and the other people in the family see different things in the kids and can support different things. Hmm. And so like in my business, I have, well, I need to work on this and I need to work on that and this and that and da, da, da. And, uh, and I'm going to get to this other thing. I kind of know it's over here, hanging out here. And I took the assessment. I'm like, Oh, you've been leaving that hang out there a little too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's good. You know? And I'm like, okay. And then the, I loved at the bottom. It said, you know, do some work, do some things, change some things, explore some things and come back and do the test again. Yeah. And and it's see still, it's still gonna be free. <laughs> see what's happened. See what what has yeah. shifted in your in your scoring matrix and, and which areas are are you know, did you raise everything a little bit? Mm -hmm. Did you uh well and, and was I, one thing a lot. Yeah. Well if I could comment on that, I mean that's an area where like honestly, this is the kind of thing that normally you would pay a business consultant to come in and do and look at your business. You might pay them a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars to come in and just do an assessment of your business and tell you where you're missing out. And so this is a shortcut to that. This doesn't replace all the nuanced advice a business consultant would give you, but it's free. So that's otherwise it's a lot. In other words, it's a lot cheaper. Um, and I'll also, that also, when you complete the assessment, if you give me your email address, you also join the Thrive School newsletter. Well, I'll send you advice and like specific, you know, resources and tools um, and tactics to apply to your business to improve it, you know, and by the way, I keep saying apply to your business, but this is true. If you're starting a brand new business, all the better. Don't learn things the hard way like I did and, you know, brute force your way through making a bunch of mistakes. Instead, take the shortcut, please. I'm trying to give you the shortcut. Just take it. No, that's great. And there's also a Kindle version of the book. Because <laughs> of course. Lazy me. I don't want to carry books anymore. Um, 
I'm not and sure. Audible. We've got a lot of, I love hearing from people who listen. I mean, I, I love for, hearing from anybody who reads the book at all. The people who listen to the audiobook, they're like, John, we went out. It was like we sat down for coffee and you talked to me for like three hours. And I'm oh, like, that's oh, cool. God. Although that's kind of a rude friend. If I talked to you for three hours and I didn't ask you anything, but. <laughs> we'll have to see um, how that how that goes. So did you have anything else you wanted to share, to say? I mean, I sort of feel like, what do I, th well, okay. In my business, what I tell people is mm -hmm. you cannot control what comes at you. You cannot sure. control what happens. Um, the only thing you can control really is how you respond to those things. And yes. so in your business, it's the same thing. You know, you, you can't, you can't control when the phone rings, but you can do things to reach out to people to get the phone to ring more. So the, if I could say amen to that and say the most powerful construct that I use personally to leverage that in my business and my personal life is not in the book, but it is hanging on a plaque right next to my computer right here. <laughs> and it's the serenity prayer. Oh, I love that. I, yeah. and, I, and, I've, and I had heard the serenity prayer multiple times, but just the first paragraph, I didn't know it's a lot longer than that until recently, but you got to hear it. Do you mind if I just read it for you? That would be wonderful. Okay. Because it's right here. I mean, I'm looking at it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. I have that here for a reason. It's because I need to read it every day because that whole thing of saying like, accept the things I cannot change and courage to change the things I can. That's the hard part, not just a business, but life. Like there's so many, we're, you know, there's so much chaos going on in the world right now that we can't change. I mean, Afghanistan, Delta variant, you know, uh, Cuomo and Biden and whatever, I don't know, whatever your, whatever the crisis is, it's easy to get distracted by that stuff because it feels like a real problem and it is a real problem, but you have to pause and ask, what can I change? And your goal here is not to try to, I'm not trying to make you feel weak or like you can't, you know, you, because the answer is in the, the examples that I gave, not much, right? But the point there is then to say, then just accept it. That doesn't mean you have to like it, but just accept it and focus on the things that you can change because there's so much more that you can change and that you have power over. So don't get, sucked into the scroll, the infinite scroll on any social media platform or news website, getting sucked into all these problems that you have zero control over and just focus on the things that you do have control over where you can make a difference. And That's, those are the things in your life and your business. Those are the things you have power over. Yes. And, and that you, yeah, I love that. Uh, yes. I, th I think I was probably 28 when I first came across that prayer. Oh Yeah. Yeah. And it, and, and, and I was a perfectionist and I was trying to fix the world and try yep. to fix everything. And, and I, the very first time I heard that prayer, said that prayer, I just started to cry because I'm mm -hmm. like, Oh my heavens. I've been, I've been looking at this from the wrong side all the time. Yep. And when I, when I switch it still, and you said, it's not easy. It's not easy to accept. But the key thing you said is accepting doesn't mean liking, doesn't mean approving. It just means you say, this is what is. Well, it's sort of like, if I could give an example of it, if you have a hurricane, if you can see a hurricane on the horizon, you can see, and you can see a funnel and it's coming towards you. Oh, that's right. You're in Kansas. That's tornado country, right? Tornado country. Okay. So let's switch it. It's a tornado. So let's say you got the tornado. You can see a tornado in the field. It's spinning and it's coming at you. And there's a guy next to you with a microphone saying, you know, this just in, there's a horrible tornado coming through likely to destroy most of society. And you can sit there and you can listen to that guy. You could look at the tornado. You can even say, man, that sucks that this tornado is coming here. Can you believe there's another tornado? I thought we were done with that. You could spend all your energy trying to just talk about how bad the tornado is, maybe even shake your fist at it, maybe get out you know, a sign and like start waving it to try to like fan the tornado back. But if you can imagine that visual and how 
how not helpful that is, you realize what's actually more helpful in that situation, the things where you have power are you can get out of the way of the tornado. You could go help other people get out of the way of the tornado. You can batten down the hatches to make sure less things are destroyed in the path of the tornado, but the tornado is beyond your control. And so that's an example of something that you just have to accept. You don't have to like it. You don't have to accepting. It doesn't mean you say I'm pro tornado now. It just means <laughs> you accept the tornado and then you work around it. Right. Right. And you do the things you can do. And that's yeah. a really, and that I think really and truly is the first step in going from striving, surviving to thriving mm -hmm. is is determining what you can do and then taking action. And when you do that, you're going to move yourself further down the path towards thriving. So yes. this, back there. this book is 100% focused on things that you can control. There's plenty of stuff in there. That's why it says any economy, including this one. There's plenty of stuff in there that talks about, okay, here's what's going on in the world right now. I leveraged my economics degree enough to say, like, here's what's shifting. Like, outside of health crisis, outside of politics, economically, here's what's shifting in the world. But that's just like identifying the tornado and saying, like, look, there's a tornado out here. Okay, now let's focus on what do you do about it? You know, like it's it's less focused on like, let's not get mad about the tornado. That's not going to help anyone. Oh, it's just waste your energy. Yeah. You know, and so, and so yeah, that's, that's great, John. That's great. So well, good. Well, thank you for being in Kansas. That helps uh, That helped the metaphor. <laughs> right there in a good place, right? No, it's it's been great. And so, um, like I said, I'll put, the, I'll put the link both for the quiz which I think maybe I can put these both up there. Oh, hey. I have to change them back. So I'll put the link for that in the comments and I'll put the link for your book there so that people can do that. And your Great. comments, how to connect with you on social media is in the description. And this will be in my uh, private Facebook group called The Healing Path. And so if people want to ask questions, I'll make sure you get those. They want to Great. comment on my personal page. I was put on there too because everybody's on there. And we'll just carry on the conversation. And I encourage people to go and take this Thrive Score because it's just interesting to where you are, what you're doing, how you're approaching things. And John, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate that you came and shared all these good ideas. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting this and for inviting me as a guest. And please keep up the good work. I will. Take care.